So I want to uh, start by um, thanking everyone for, for being here and joining us. So I'm just going to share about Rani um, and tell you a little bit about her, because when I was introduced to her, I was very impressed. So uh, Veronica Holcomb, um, her, man her mantra is uh, transforming, one, transforming our world one leader at a time. And, uh, and this phrase captures Veronica Holcomb's life, uh, both as a leadership coach, a strategist um, and a leadership development and strategist coach. Uh, for more than 30 years, Veronica has worked with leaders who accept the challenge to lead and perform at higher levels of impact and influence. Uh, and known for her integrity and warmth, Veronica's clients consist consistently affirm her ability to help them clarify their and achieve a higher vision of success for themselves and the people that that they lead. Um, and uh, Ronnie, welcome. Thank you so much for for uh, being uh, coming and joining us today uh, when we talk about um, leadership in these challenging times. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's good to be here. So uh, I kind of gave the abridged version of uh, of your bio because you're, you've actually achieved a lot more than that, I know. Um, and uh, and as a result, we, you know, we, we you know we'll be diving into that a little bit later. Um, but firstly, I'd really like to talk about um, about your work, uh, your work as as a leadership and actually as a coach. And we had a conversation beforehand, um, and it, you know, I just mentioned that you've been you've been a coach for thirty years, and actually, I I think that I actually you mentioned a book that you've written called uh, Ready Set Grow. Very set grow. That's it. And and I was and I actually did some coaching when I was in England many years ago. And that was one of the books on my shelves, which was kind of quite it was quite remarkable. And I love the connection. It's really kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, so so and, and, and you've you a leadership coach, but you kind of got into this before. I mean, now there's a lot of coaches out there. Um, there's a lot of um, people that, that are qualified and there's a lot of people that are not qualified that call themselves coaches, but you were in there right at the very beginning. So tell us, tell us about, you know, how did you even get into coaching and, you know, what was, I always find that there's a, there's a pivotal point. So what was that pivotal point for you? Well, I got into coaching before there was coaching. It really was in the beginning and the world was void of form and all of that. You know, we were doing something called individual executive development, focusing on the development of the softer skills of style, communication, leadership, relationships. Um, the work is the same today, but there was no coaching. Coaching didn't show up as we know it, uh, for many years. By the time the International Coaching Federation, which is the premier certifying body today, by the time they became a thing, I uh, had already been coaching for 12 years. We didn't call it coaching at that time. So, um, you know, I was doing work. I um, did a lot of work in management development and supervisory development in my younger days uh, at a financial services institution in New York, which is where I lived for, for 37 years. And, and, and it was a great career. I loved it. I loved it. I was an internal consultant. I did some very cool things around organizational development, designing programs, delivering programs. I really enjoyed that work. And I worked for some pretty amazing women. Uh, at that time, I was hired by a woman. And I don't know that she was the greatest boss. Don't tell her I said that. But um, uh, I thought she was pretty insightful to be able to see my skills and talents and how that could work in this training and development space. And I had no experience in training and development. And I went on and became, and I got promoted and went to a larger uh, organization. And ultimately I became the divisional director of training and development for a 4,000 member division, but it's corporate America <laughs> and things happen reorganizations. People come in and they want their people. And so then I started to work for a man and that was not, that wasn't a, that wasn't a good time. That was, that was difficult. Um, you know, trying to demonstrate my value when he had different blinders on or screens. 
So ultimately I left that job, but while I was working in the bank, I wanted to go on my own. And I, the whole time, because I, I thought as an external consultant, I could make a lot more money. And so I went to an organization in New York uh, for women entrepreneurs where I could get free coaching. The name escapes me right now. Um, but, uh, and I went and they said, okay, Ronnie, this, or Veronica, this is really interesting, but darling, you need to go back to work, <laughs> get a few more promotions, more experience, and then come back, which is what I did. I came back five, six years later and they said, okay, now you're well-trained. So this was always my goal. So when I was, when I was, ah, when I was, um, um, after I left the bank, I was working for, um, another woman, um, entrepreneur, and we were delivering training to, um, um, Exxon. It wasn't even Exxon Mobil. So this is how long ago that was. Um, and it was, it was okay. I wasn't very satisfying because I didn't, um, I didn't enjoy um, long-term relationship with participants. They came in and they left. Um, so I came upon these people that were doing this very interesting work, individual executive development. And I was very intrigued by that because it was very different than any kind of training that I had done um, because we were doing this over the course of time as opposed to you know, three days training. Uh, and it was a two-on-one process, an older white male, with a younger black female and one <clears throat> participant. Um, fascinating. So I signed up to to work with them, and and I, and, and, it, <laughs> and that's how it started. And that was in 1982. So I've been I've been at the coaching work for a long time, long time. A lot of leaders. So your it, it sounds like you've I mean you been in this world of growth and development for, you know, from the very embryonic stages of it. Um, and, and, you know, it's to be able to, to be able to watch an industry grow like that, I think is, is quite, you know, it, it shows a lot about number one, who you are, but it also shows a lot about the industry itself, that it's, it's had that ability to keep going because there is that need Definitely. for really supporting people in their, um, in their growth and changing their mindset and understanding how the, the old ways of doing things aren't necessarily the, the right way or the best way or, you know, the, the, the should, we should carry on doing the way and, and how change so needs to happen. Right. Um, and, and maybe you can share with us a coaching story, something that you've, how you worked with somebody that you've been able to shift their mindset. Well, <clears throat> I, I don't, I, I, I like to think I don't shift their mindsets, but create the atmosphere <clears throat> and the space for people to discover um, their own path. However, <laughs> um, they may not always feel that way. I talked to a gentleman about, about a month ago, and then I coached him at least 20 years ago, and he told me that I told him that it would be, uh, I don't remember, important for him to lead this particular organization. And if I said their name, you'd absolutely know them. Uh, big time organization because uh, it wasn't a good fit for him. He's a CEO today. He's been a CEO for, for, for many years. Um, so um, I have many stories like that. People that I've seen, um, that I met when they were managers or um, directors and over the course of time have grown into very senior levels. And I've also seen people who have decided, you know what, after, you know, examining, you know, this corporate thing, I, I think this is not for me. And I'd like to go in a, in a different direction. And I think that's just as valuable. Sorry, I noticed I keep on putting myself on mute here so that I'm not disturbing you and disturbing your image. Um, it, it, yeah, absolutely. I, that, that I think is a, it's a, it's a great story about how we can, um, about the power of of that work of the work that you do, so uh, you you your your book Ready Set Grow um, 
it's uh, unfortunately, I, I, uh, it's it's a it's a. Mm, I was going to say unfortunately, I don't have it anymore because I I got rid of ninety percent, five percent of my life when I moved over yeah. here. Um, Understandable. And, uh, and and books were unfortunately I lost way too many good books and yours was definitely among them but tell us a little bit about that book and and why you chose to why you chose to to, to write it and what was the message that you were trying to to portray you know there there wasn't a compelling message in the book um after being in coaching for i don't know um after i guess other people started to come into coaching. The world changed. Now we've got competition. We didn't have a lot of competition in the early days. And the people coming into this space were coming in with initials that I did not have. Psychologists, clinical people, um, social workers. And so I needed to separate myself from the fray. We have many, many coaches, but not many have written books. So that was part of it. And when I work with people, you know, you work on a couple of tracks. There is the developmental track. In other words, someone may, may have trouble with their staff. Um, the staff does not believe in them for whatever reason. And we would get feedback and we would be working that along the way for six months to a year. But then there are things that come up as we're taking that journey we may have to talk about how do you play the game? How do you manage change? Um, let's talk about confidence. There are other things that come into to play. And that's what the, the book was, to identify a lot of those things and to um, develop some exercises uh, so that people could use it as a reference and somewhat as a workbook. So it's not the kind of book that you need to read, it makes sense to read uh, you know, from cover to cover. You can just go in and find what is of uh, interest or, or need for you. However, I've got a couple more books coming and they are coming directly you know, from inside. You know, I've been pretty cranky about the state of leadership for years, years. And my thinking is that we've got to do more. We've got to do better because it's pathetic. Um, everywhere, I'm not just, I mean, everywhere. Religious institutions, our government, um, municipalities, and just across the board. And my belief is that we need to teach children to lead. And I don't mean teenagers, I mean kids, six years old, seven years old, we need to start there. So just hang on, I've identified a number of competencies and picture golden books, and I've got 37 of 40 drafts written. So just hang on, there's more, there's more to come <laughs> in terms of books. And I've got a, another one um, that uh, should be coming out I don't know, uh, hopefully soon. Um, I've got one of my editors, one of my besties is online. I saw her there, hey Joe, <laughs> who's gonna be doing the editing, but we, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, these are not easy to do. I, I love the idea of, uh, of supporting the, the youth to uh, the young people of our country because they are our future in, in understanding what leadership and good leadership looks like. Um, and, and, uh, and I think, and you, I, I mean, yeah, the state of leadership in this country is, um, is challenging for sure. That's, uh, that's very polite. <laughs> <laughs> I think I use that language. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, you, dip, diplomacy, I believe is, uh, <laughs> Hold on, diplomatic. Sometimes I am and sometimes I'm not, but <laughs> I do my best. Yeah. I really do my best. Um, so, so and, and, and overcoming challenges, I think that in itself is, uh, you know, you know if, we, if we look back on our lives, there have been, you know, so many challenges that, that probably each each and every one of us have, have gone through in our own in our own way but I'd love to find out a little bit more about your the challenges that you've um, experienced in your life um, over the over the years um, and I'm sure there have been one or two to say the least 
Oh my God. Yeah. I've survived, uh, since I've been in business, I've survived five recessions. I'm hopeful to survive the sixth one that we're in now. Um, but I've had a lot of personal challenges like, like everyone else. You know, I, my daughter had a horrific accident. My husband's had a uh, kidney transplant. Um, there just been, it is really difficult. And I know there are a number of women on the call relate to this, managing a business, managing life. Uh, you may, if you don't have children, maybe you have elderly parents. It is not easy. And it's not like when we're entrepreneurs, um, it's not like working in, in, a, in a corporation where you know other folks can sort of do your job for a while if, you, if you're unavailable for whatever reason, or that you have paid sick leave, it's not that. We're still expected to deliver. So um, you know, I've, I've, I've had a lot, um, but it's, it's, I've had a lot of support, a lot of prayer <laughs> uh, to help me to overcome a lot of that. It's, you know, you've heard it before, you know, we all have challenges. It's just, it's how do we deal with them? And it's through the support of the women, um, a number of whom are on this call, and you know who you are, um, that has supported me, that's, that's helped me through that. These, these, these things. Yeah, and it's interesting. You, you, you talk about the women in your life, and and I, I, I'm, I totally agree with that because there's a level of, of, um, you know, uh, I mean, even through Nabo, I, I experience that. I experience the, 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 the level of connection and just being able to reach out to other women. Yeah and you know get their support when we're in when we when we're struggling um yeah. As yeah. we've all been doing recently for, for for many you know many different reasons um i know i i certainly have you know this past few months have been challenging difficult yeah yeah, yeah. Oh my others so I, you know, I, I believe so strongly. I, I believe I do a lot of work with, you know, in the beginning, most of my uh, clients were men because it's, you know, it's the early eighties and that's just who was in those positions. Um, but I've done a lot of work with women, a lot of women's programs. And so confidence or the lack of confidence um, is, a, is a huge issue for women. Um, and I, I think, there, there's not much that we can do, but I think the antidote <laughs> is women supporting women. Mm -hmm. I believe that so strongly. So I'm very intentional about ensuring that I have those, those structures in place. Um, you know, I was sharing for, for nine years, nine, 10 years, I met on the first Monday uh, every month with two women, nine years. And that kind of uh, emotional infrastructure, you know, helps you to go through life because who lost their husband, who's going through a divorce, you know, our business has changed as solopreneurs. I mean, radically changed uh, from the early days. We don't, you know, we've got to have new business models. So having these people in my life and I, I to this day, you know, continue to work with women in small groups and discuss books and uh, have <laughs> virtual drinks over Zoom. You know, all of those things are are terribly important. And you know, I tell people all the time, I think I'm a pretty competent person. I don't think I would have had business for these many years or been married for as long as I've been married, 44 years last week. Um, but Without the support of my sisters, it would have been much harder, much. Yeah, I, I agree with you that that community that we build of uh, good women, good, good women. Mm -hmm. I just kind of would like to go back, uh, if you'd be willing, just to go back to one of the things that you talked about. You talked about the exercises in your book and you talked about how confidence is so important. Um, I think especially for women, I, I, it is for guys too, but, but especially for women yes. um, and, and, and also for women of color. 
Mm -hmm. So do you, and we, I didn't, we kind of didn't really talk about this too much beforehand, but is there a, is there a, an exercise that you could just share with us briefly that, and, and it might not be appropriate, might be something that we'll send out afterwards um, that could really just support people in, in having that inner confidence within themselves. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. So um, let me say this. Um, it is often the case with women. It's just unfortunate because there are these there are these negative expectancies for us, and I think they're airborne. And then a lot of the culture feels very free to ignore us in meetings, interrupt us in meetings, put us down, say things. And so way too many women have had experiences where someone said something to them that reduced their confidence. You can't lead, you can't sing, you don't do math well, you're not pretty something, but it all reduces down to you're not good enough. And the, as women, and we hang on, we're hanging on to this baggage that is not ours for years, decades. You could retire with it. And this belief that I'm not good enough. And that, that, allow, that it keeps us from stepping into greater opportunities and it affects what we say to ourselves about our success and failure. So what I would say is, when you have had a success, do not say things like, oh my God, I got lucky. Thank you. The moon and the stars were in alignment and it all worked out. Mm -mm. That does nothing for your confidence. What I want you to say is, boy, I'm good. And I've got talent and I worked hard. So it's my ability and my effort. That's what builds confidence. There's more to this. I wish it were just that simple, but uh, we do a lot of sabotaging of ourselves right here. And when we've had failure, because we bomb, we do have failures, do not say, I guess I just can't do whatever, fill in the blank. I guess I just, I told my boss I couldn't do that. I'm not good at, because what now you're saying is there's something innately wrong with me and there's something, you know, there's some wiring here and you have sabotaged your effort all by yourself because it is about effort that will bring success. And with success, that's how we build confidence. It's our, it, it comes out of our relationship with success. So if you'd like for me to share a little chapter from my book on that, I'm happy to do that, Elizabeth. I'll send it to you, to Beth, and you folks can figure out what you'd like to do with that. After. That, that would be wonderful. We, I'm sure everybody would love that. And I certainly would love it because uh, I need to go out and buy it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I kind of want to bring us on to... Um, I really want to kind of bring us on to the, the people that have influenced us. And I'd be curious to know, like, who's been uh, an influence in your life? Who's really made a difference in, in uh, maybe it was in your youth, maybe it was in, in your business, in your, you know, when you were in corporate America, maybe it was in, you know, as you're, you know, uh, stepping out on your own in your own business. Who's been the biggest influence for you? Well, certainly my husband has been really uh, supportive and influential. And in those days, the early days, when I thought about really stepping out, because stepping out meant you know, renting space in midtown Manhattan. And that was like a very big deal. It's still a big deal. Um, but he believed that I could do it. And I thought, well, you know, I believe in him. And if he believes in me, then I can believe in me. That's also part of developing confidence, being with people who believe in your growth and development. But I, I have to say my mom has probably been the, the biggest influence. You know, her example, you know, as we were coming up, she sacrificed a lot. We didn't, we were, we didn't have much. Um, you know, I come from very, very humble background. 
um, but she she worked really hard. She made sure that we were able to, um, you know, enjoy some things, not fancy, but, you know, I went to camp every year. That meant a lot. Um, she made our clothes. Um, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that, but, you know, today I'm not bad with my hands. You know, I like hand, I like needle, needle arts. Um, but her example, uh, you know, she passed away about nine months ago. And when we were packing some things up, oh my God, she had so many journals and notebooks. And I don't remember, I don't remember her, I don't remember that when I was young, her writing in journals and notebooks, but you, you should see how many I have. <laughs> it is kind of funny how some things are taught and some things are just, they're caught. But she prayed a lot to the end. She prayed a, a lot for us. Um, and I'm saying my brother, who may be on this call too, and my sister, and, um, and anyone who's going through. Uh, if you're my friend and you were going through some things, you know, she was going to pray for you and, and your family. So uh, she was ordained uh, as a minister at age 80, to give you a sense. She just never stopped growing, never stopped learning. She got, she went to, um, she got her um, uh, BA in her 50s. She went back to college. Um, so I think, you know, following that example of hard work, faith, never giving up. And then, you know, when she was, she's, she died at 92 and she grew up in the segregated South in, in, in Augusta, Georgia. And she shared a story with us um, of her being on the bus with her grandmother. And the rules were that you could ride on the, in the front of the bus unless a white passenger wanted your seat. Then you had to go to the back. And she was with her grandmother and uh, um, a white passenger wanted their seat. And uh, grandmother Elise said, no. And she wasn't gonna give up her seat. And she had a presence about her and a strength that the bus driver did not make her. So I, I, you know, my mother's a very nice person, but if anything went wrong that was unjust, oh, she'd be at the newspaper. And all, of, well, I don't have a large family, but all the women are very nice people. But um, justice is really important. Very important. It's just part of our DNA. Um, thank you for sharing that story. It's, um, it's a very sad story that that's the way that that's the way it used to be and, and in a way still is in different ways. In, you know, in a different way, it might not be on a bus, but that injustice is, right. um, and that's why we're going through what we are going through and about time too, really, you know, it's overdue. Um, and uh, I just, I am just, uh, I mean, uh, you know, from Narbo's point, we're, we're doing what we can, we're starting, we're starting to support the bringing in more justice and yes. in, and that needs you know it's, it's a question of, of education it's a question of um understanding but that story is beautiful thank you for sharing mm -hmm. um and i can i can see that there's there's a, a level you talk about your grandmother and you talk about your your mother with such um love and um connection and, and you talk about presence and and i definitely see that that has rubbed off <laughs> that's not an idea you have a presence about you as well <laughs> and uh, and the fact that your mother got ordained at 80 that's just wild like good, <laughs> good for her because many an 80 year old would just be uh, i don't know in the rocking chair yeah, just mm -mm. she never stopped. Never stopped. She was going to the nursing home to minister to the very end. Yeah, you know, just never stopped. 
Wonderful. And, and it sounds like you're on that path as well, because having written one book and you say, oh, I've got another two mm -hmm. up here and, you know, we're just going to pull the bits together. So uh, it sounds like you're, you're following beautifully in, in the strong women that have trod that path before you and, and followed, following in their, their good footsteps for sure. Yeah. And I, I mean, she, she had a higher calling and I, I feel I do too. You know, I wasn't called to ministry uh, or missionary work in, you know, some third world country. It was to corporate America <laughs> and, and the workplace. And so it, it is a, it's a larger calling. I feel this is why that I'm here on the planet. This is my purpose. I grow leaders. And I was talking with Beth, my admin and shout out to Beth who made all of this happen. Um, I probably won't retire. You know, I'm of that age, but um, mm -mm. no rocking chairs here. Mm -mm. I'm very happy to hear that, and uh, and I'm sure that there's a, a lot of people out there that would still benefit hugely from connecting with you. And I'm hoping that this conversation is just the beginning of some new connections for you and some new learning for, for the people can learn who you are and, and uh, gain your wisdom. Um, so let's talk about, let's talk about regrets because um, that's all part of life as well. Um, you know, what are some of the regrets that have happened in your life? You know, we had talked about this before and it's, I, I still, I'm having a tough time. Um, you know, I remember when I, I think by the time I'd gotten to college, I regretted having uh, not studied Latin when I was in high school. That may sound weird, but uh, I, who would have supported me to understand that? Um, you know, I had to get special permission to go into a college program um, you know, my grades did not suggest that I needed permission, but the, you know, the guidance counselor back then, didn't, that didn't make sense for her, that I might want to do that. Uh, so Latin. And, um, you know, by the time I got out of college, I, I wish I had at least minored in um, speech and communication. I'd sort of figured that out by the time I was a senior. My friend Joanne um, went up to the American School for the Deaf and I was smitten. Um, but, um, uh, regrets, I, you know, I, I have, a, I have the opposite problem. Um, I'm a delusional optimist. So everybody and anybody who works with me or around, you hear me say, well, how hard could that be? You know, let's try it. How hard could that be? You know, when I wrote Ready, Set, Grow, I thought I put a Gantt chart together for those of you who has a chart and, I'll have this done in six months. How hard could that be? Three years later, um, things are hard. <laughs> so I, I don't let fear typically stop me. Um, but I'm not foolish either. Because I do believe in, you know, the scriptures tell us that there is wisdom in many counselors. So before I make major decisions, I would, uh, you know, I, I talk to people. I always talk to my mom. I would never, ever make a major decision without talking to my mother, my husband. I talked to my friend Jackie. I talked to my friend Beth. Um, I, I have, you know, Joanne. There are a number of people, and depending on, you know, um, what area that you might be in, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get some feedback and make a decision. So I'm, I'm careful that way. Um, but I don't typically let fear stop me. I love that. I love that. And, and I think I, I would have to ditto that about me. You know, I've got that uh, <laughs> optimism, as you call it. Delusional. <laughs> my answer is always like, yeah, and then we'll figure out how to do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Sure. Can do that. Of course we can do that. And we'll yeah. just keep it all out. No, I mean, looking at what I did to start a business, this is crazy in Manhattan, New York City with white males and financial services, what was I thinking? I guess I wasn't. I just figured I could do it. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> you, just did. you just did. That's perfect. That's, uh, that's exactly what needs to happen. 
Um, so we, we you know we've learned a little bit about you, just a little bit about you, because there's a whole lot. And we had a wonderful conversation before this, and you know, I learned a lot more about you. And I know that there is a lot more, but I'd kind of like to bring the conversation around to what's happening at the moment mm. um, with the Black Lives Matter movement and how we are, uh, you know, the, the injustice, the terrible injustice that's happening. And, and are there any words of wisdom that you could share with us that you could speak to somebody that's going through sadness, anger, grief right now, because there's so many emotions that are, that are bubbling around. Maybe you can share some words of wisdom to, to support people that are in this challenging time. And it is, yeah. I mean, I'm struggling too. Um, I can't stop crying. It's just every day. Um, it's really challenging. And I, um, I wish there were something simple to say, um, but there isn't uh, particularly. I, I think we have to go through those emotions. I think we have to grieve. I think we have to go through the sadness. And I, and I think we have to look at what is it that is causing our pain? Because at some point I'm like, why? You know, it's not that I didn't cry for Trayvon Martin and uh, Tamir Rice and that, but this I can't seem to stop. What is that? And I think it's the, the cumulative effect of this. And I think it's just soul trauma. It's soul trauma. It's so difficult. So I, I think the words of wisdom would be to reach out uh, to a, a kindred spirit, to another sister. Sometimes, you know, I say all the time, I, you know, if you want me to come in, I'll just cry with you. I don't necessarily have any words, but to be that kind of support, to connect with each other, you know, in that pain, in that suffering. And, and I think I was thinking about how the, uh, the protesters are coming together, which is that's very inspiring, the young people. I think if I was young in my 20s and, and didn't think I'd ever die or get sick, I'd be out there too, um, but I can't do that. Um, but to look at them coming together in, in this, this community of pain and they give us hope. Hope comes from that. And so, at some level, we, and, I, and maybe this comes with maturity and age, we, we can get somewhat comfortable in our sadness and, and, um, and the suffering, knowing that there is resurrection on the other side. Um, there's hope, there will be light. But right now, um, in this time, I think we should do the work, you know, let's do the deep work and, and go, all of us, go inside and what's happening, what's causing the pain. Um, because in there, um, we may get information as to next steps for us individually. So what, what would you say that, and, and, and What would you say were the, 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 the next steps for, for because we, we, change needs to happen. I mean, change so needs to happen. So what could, what could that look like? Because I, I'm, I'm speaking to a lot of people and, and, and they're like, okay, this, this, it's not okay. What yeah. is happening, it's not okay. And we, and we're, we're struggling. We, you know, and, and how do we bring this together? Um, so maybe you can shed some wisdom on that as well. Well, I think you, you said something earlier. I think, you know, education is a piece of it. I do think we need to do the deeper work. Let's take a look inside, um, uh, you know, what's going on with ourselves and, 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 and then with that, start to connect with others but education about what's going on, the history of the struggle uh, for black folk, um, black and brown folk and indig indigenous people 
here in the United States, it's, you know, it's a, it's a tough history. It's a tough history. Uh, I think that's terribly important. And then I, I think we should really try to grow where we are planted. We're all gifted. We have different gifts. I believe we're all expressions of God. And, and what is it that you can do in your locality? So maybe I'm you know, not gonna start a Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement. Probably not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'm not gonna do something big like that. But in my sphere of influence, in this pond, what pebble can I drop that has that ripple effect? So, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't think we have to look far because there are a lot of talented people who are doing probably very amazing things uh, on this call. And is it possible that you can reimagine some of these things and do them differently for different audiences? That's what I think we can do. And, and that may require, you know, talking. I mean, I was chatting with my friend Jackie uh, last night about this very thing. She's got idea after idea after idea. So it's connecting with others and saying, you know, I want to commit to this. I want to commit to this. Let's talk about some things. What do you see that I might do? Here are some ideas that I have. Let's connect and let's brainstorm. Um, let's just reimagine. We're going to have to do this. None of us know what life looks like on the other side of COVID and on the other side of this, these, these seismic changes that are happening now. So let's go in and let's access our creativity, our current resources. How can we reimagine them? Thank you, yeah. And, and I know that um, as, you know, obviously being president of this association, there's things that I, that I can do and, and looking at how I can, you know, NAVA as an organization has always, uh, even in its mission, has always been supportive of women across the board. Um, and, and yet there's a lot, a lot more that can be done. Mm -hmm. So our conversation today, as far as I'm concerned, is just the beginning, mm -hmm. just the very first step. The exactly. very first step. Um, we're also planning on having a uh, an open conversation for our members um, uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, that we because we there's got to be a level of exactly as you say, listening to one another. It does, and, and that's very difficult, the deep listening that we have to do. And, and that's, the, that's part of the sacrifice. That's the letting go of the egoic nature. That's the, the removing of the screens of your education, of your, your opinion, background, culture. All of that has to be removed so that we hear people from here. From our hearts yeah that's it's it's and and i think also just being open being willing being open and and um and and and, and looking around and seeing that what is and has been happening you know is not okay and it's not okay to keep on turning and pretending it's not happening it's not okay to do that and and how that has to stop. Um, I remember, yeah, oh, maybe this is not the appropriate place for that story, but there are some, you know, some, just some bad things that, that, that are just not okay in any shape or form. And, and, and um, you know, my commitment as president of NABU will be to, to, to start that change. Thank you. Yeah, because it takes leadership. This takes, it takes leadership. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, because I, I would love to, to talk more to you about it and to have that conversation with you and with other black and brown women and women of color and, 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 and Asian women and, and you know, just, just women, just 
all come together and just have that quote unquote difficult conversation. Because I think if we come from a heart and we're open, then it's not so difficult. I agree. I agree. It's not so difficult. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, I feel myself getting emotional at that as well. And I and I and I see I see many companies around that are starting just starting to to say okay we are going to commit to you know and they'll you know we're going to commit to supporting black women owned companies we're going to supporting uh, we're going to look to supporting whatever it is that they're looking to support um, uh, you know even from you know Uber Eats you know, the, the big companies out there are actually starting to make a difference. And I think that that your place in, in, as you say, you know, each leader, one leader at a time. That's right. Mm -hmm. Just so powerful. And, and I think that if, if each and every one of us can, can have that open conversation with with another woman whether she's whether she's black or white or brown or asian or and and just how can we work together you don't know the impact that you'll have you know when i when i started i'm trying to remember where i was um it was just a i was in between i hadn't opened the office no i hadn't started coaching i think and I, I went to, I was, um, um, I had done some graduate work at the new school and I went to see one of the department chairs and I think he'd been a consultant and I just went to get some mentoring and uh, advice. And he uh, basically said, uh, I, I don't think you're gonna be successful. I, I don't think, I don't think you can do this. And I said, gee, uh, well, you know, I just connected with this woman and she's going to pay me $500 a day to do some work at Exxon, which, you know, back then that was a lot of money, it still is. Um, and he said, oh, well, that's good for you. So I walked out of his office feeling awful. And I ran into this woman. I had only met her casually, professionally. I did not know her well, but it was like she was an angel. And she said, she poo-pooed him, she encouraged me. You know, I didn't go home with all of his stuff all over me. I mean, it's a, I tell the story today, but it was about her, uh, how inspired and encouraged I was by her words. I never saw her again. I never saw her again. So sometimes, yeah, we can work together, we can do some wonderful, but maybe it's just a word of encouragement. But it's taking the time to reach out, to say this person is important. You know, I want to connect to this woman. Yeah, maybe she was an angel. She was, <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. And he wasn't. <laughs> I won't tell you what I called him, but. <laughs> No, well, no, I, I can, I can, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's interesting because I think that women, um, I mean, I, I know that uh, Bank of America, Bank of America, or was it American Express? One of those banks did a survey recently, no, last year, last year's survey, and they, it was 2019, and they talked about uh, the, the level of, um, uh, they talked about venture capital loans and how much uh and i i should have got my facts right before i before i talk about this but i know certain statistics which is something along the lines of like 18 million dollars or no must, maybe it was billion dollar anyway it was a huge amount of money that's been given last year in in venture capital loans and out of that two percent went to women oh. And, and, and out of that 2%, 0.008% or 0.08% 0 went to women of color. And, and I'm like, I am so sorry, that is so not okay in okay. any shape or form. So 
change has to happen. It has to happen. And, and each of us, we may not be able to take the streets right now for whatever reason, whether it's, whether it's like the COVID, which is a real risk. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. but, 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 and, and, uh, but at the end of the day, even if we can't take to the streets, we need, we need to make a difference, each and every single person. And that is my wish for everyone on this call. Like, do something, don't do, do something. Nothing. Do something, do something. If we all did one something, if everyone did that, mm -hmm, do something. Yeah. So important. So I know that we're kind of getting to the end of the session and, and, um, and I kind of uh, wanted just to ask um, one more question, uh, which is, what do you want to be remembered for? Well, I think, you know, from the world's point of view, sort of looking at, you know, Veronica, Ronnie Holcomb, when it's all said and done, and I'd like to be remembered as having made a contribution to the, uh, to the healing of the planet through leadership development. Um, and then from the, in the minds of the leaders, but from, from the beginning, for as long as I, when I was a teacher, it's always been important for me to know that I've had an impact on someone's life. That's the work. And, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's, um, having an impact is, is, it's funny, I, when I was, I did some coaching, um, actually I did a, a, some uh, Jungian shadow coaching many years ago, which was when I was in that, that world a little bit. And, um, and it's true, just having that level of making a difference. Yeah. yeah. And talking about Black Lives Matter, you know, if each and every one of us can, can step into that place and, and support the connection, not the, not the disconnection, support the justice, not the injustice. That's right. Yeah. And, and as I say, you know, we have lots of opportunity because I know there were very talented people here, but I was, re was thinking about it just in our everyday lives, um, maybe just as mothers. I was in Costco a couple of years ago and waiting for a rotisserie chicken and, um, and it was a white woman there and, and, a, and a white fellow with, um, with his son came. Then the boy had to be about nine. And he said, um, okay, I'm gonna look over here, wait for the chicken, which make sure that these ladies go first. And so the chicken came out and the, um, the white lady got her chicken and then the boy grabbed the chicken. <laughs> and he went to his dad and said, I did it. I did what you told me. I waited. And he wasn't lying. He wasn't trying to deceive his father. He just didn't see me. I was invisible. So what we can do things in small ways, doesn't always have to be big, but small ways in our everyday lives. And I think we need to be mindful about that and intentional. Thank you, Ronnie. Little things, little things, little, little things. things. What is it? How do you climb a mountain one step at a time? <laughs> right, exactly. In the journey of a thousand miles it was something I can't remember who said uh, that. Gandhi or somebody, yeah, some, yeah. yeah. A very wise soul, whoever it was. Step at a time, yeah, incremental. And know that, you know, uh, these things take generations. And so the best we can do is, as I say, it's the ripple in the, you know, the pebble in the pond and know there's a ripple effect, but we may not see that we're out in the sea, get to shore. We may not, may not be in our lifetime. Thank you. 
Let's do what we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ronnie, <clears throat> I'm aware of uh, that I, we could carry on talking for a long time. <laughs> This is this is just the very first bit of the con of of, of I, I think our connection as well and the conversation that my commitment to Nabo and to the to the New York community and um, I want to thank you so much for just being here with me for sharing your wisdom for um, being inspiring. Uh, it's been a joy. It's been a joy to talk with you. Thank you. I've enjoyed meeting you and I appreciate your leadership. And as I said to you in the first conversation, because I could feel that love and that compassion and your, your deep, deep care about these issues. And, and I appreciate that. And so I look forward to our, our next conversation and the next and the next and the next.